Thank you for joining us today at the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship for our service. It's a blessing to have all of you here. It's a blessing to have those of you who are listening online. We're going to have a terrific service today. I'm glad you could be here with us. If you'd open your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. We're going to be getting, reading at verse 19. Luke, chapter 6, verses nine, uh, beginning of verse 19 through verse 31. Luke chapter 16. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they persuade it, though one rose from the dead. And shall we pray? Dear Father God, I thank Thee for sparing our lives on this side of eternity another day, and for giving me another opportunity to preach from this pulpit. I pray Thee, therefore, now, Father, that You would just fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost of God as I preach this service today. Please do not let Satan, who has already made a bid for this service, dear Father, just uh, with uh, the preparation of it, stuff that has already happened, Lord, and uh, you know, the uh, failures that we had with video equipment earlier and so on. I just pray, Lord, that you will allow this to work out, that the sermon will be recorded just fine and everything will be working and, and be able to go online, Lord. I pray that it will reach the people, that it will be a blessing to them, and just be a blessing to all the people who hear it. Hide us not behind the cross, Father. And as I said before, fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost of God as I preach. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and just for his sake we pray. Amen. Now, I don't want you to get too excited about the scripture that I just read because I am not going to be preaching on the text that the scripture is teaching specifically. But as we get into it, you will understand in a few minutes where I'm going with it. Now, if you're not feeling well, and, uh, and you know, maybe I'm, you know, kind of like me and I, I'm not feeling well and my wife will keep ragging on me and ragging on me and ragging on me to go to the doctor to see if I can figure out what's wrong and, and, and get this thing taken care of. I'm trying to make an appointment for my shoulder. I've been having some pain in my shoulder for quite some time now. No idea what's causing it and she keeps nagging me and nagging me to go to the doctor to get that thing checked out. But So if you're like that and then or just you go to the doctor just not feeling well and you go to the doctor and you say, Doc, you know something's wrong. I don't know what but I know my body. I know how... I know how I feel normally and something's just not right. And the doctor says, okay, let's see if we can figure this out. So he starts running some tests and he might do some blood work. They might take some x-rays depending on what you have. Maybe run a CAT scan, maybe an MRI, you know, different types of tests that they do. And then he, the doctor tells you to come on to his office. And so you come in and you come in and he says, why don't you sit down in that chair right there? And you're getting pretty nervous whenever doctors start talking like that, but they all always talk like that. And so you sit down in the chair, and he starts telling you what the tests have revealed and what is wrong and what's going on. And then the doctor says a statement like this. Now, if you can come and we can do these treatments and we can get this taken care of, then we can knock this thing out. We can make you well. You will be able to be whole again. You'll be well again. And you're going to live for many, many, many years to come. But if you don't do what I'm saying, and you don't do these treatments, and you just keep 
on going the way you are, then you're going to kick out at any minute. And, and when the doctor says something like this, if we have any sense at all, I mean, if there's any brain to us at all, then we're going to listen to the wisdom and the words of that doctor. Today, I am the doctor. And I am going to try to diagnose your problem as a church. And those listening, you're also your problem individually that you have as a person. I am going to try to diagnose your problem. So I want you to listen carefully today as we bring the service. The title of the sermon is, The Church Needs What's in Hell. And I... I apologize. Uh, I, f I haven't preached on hell in a long time. I actually, back when I was a younger man, I was uh, uh, I got a reputation as a hellfire brimstone kind of preacher, and I haven't been preaching on hell in quite some time. Uh, so I was uh, just kind of feeling it was it was about time to start talking about hell a little bit. And and so the sermon, the church needs what's in hell. You say, brother Spencer, um, I'm misunderstanding you. Surely you don't mean that. You can't mean that there's something in hell that we need as a church today well there certainly is and as we get into this passage you are going to find that every single one of the things that is in hell that the church needs we find in here and you will understand as we go now i want to tell you something before we get started if you are on fire for god like you used to be I mean, if you aren't as close to God now as you used to be, if you're not as close to God now as you wish that you could be, if you don't have the power of God in your life like you know you ought to, and, and, and you don't, and we had that series, um, Operation Heal America, and we were doing all of that stuff about revival and the different things to be able to have revival and bring our country, get revival to our country. And if you sat here in church and you listened to those services, and I mean, it just didn't do anything for you. I mean, you're not revived, you're not close to God like you used to be, you don't read your Bible the way you used to, you're not out talking and witnessing to people like you used to, then if you're like that and you're in that condition, I want you to listen very carefully today as we bring the message, because you need what they have in heaven hell. So what do they have in hell? What is it that they have in hell that the church needs? Well, without wasting time, let's get right into it. The first thing they have in hell that the church needs in the passage we just read, the Bible says in Luke chapter 16, verse 23, and in hell he lift up his eyes. What does it mean when you lift up your eyes? Surely you've heard someone say, like, uh, or read it in a book where it says, he lifted up his eyes, his eyes to the horizon. Or she, she looked out, she lifted up her eyes to all the things that, that she had coming. It is someone, it's a vision that people have. When people lift up their eyes, they're having a vision of what it is that they want to do, or what it is, or where they're going, or something that they want to accomplish. It means that they have a vision, and in hell, they have a vision. And the church needs a vision. We need a vision corporately as a church, and we, you, need a vision individually as a church member because the church is made up of you. Those of you listening have made up the church. I don't know what kind of goals in life you have. And, and or, or, or something, a vision that you have in life, th things that you want to do. What kind of goals do you have? I want you to think about it right now for a moment. What are your goals? What are things that you want to accomplish? There's this girl that I work with at my other job at Michael's. I've mentioned that many times. There's this girl that I work with. She's young. She's just graduated from high school, and she graduated from high school at a young age. I think she turned 17 only a couple weeks before she graduated from high school, almost 16 years old when she graduated from high school. Uh, she's, she's a very smart, very intelligent girl. She skipped a grade or two back coming through, and she's graduated from high school, and she has her goals she's telling me about them of things that she wants to do in life at first thing she's starting uh this this and, and another what august or something next month she's going to be starting at saint bonaventure university and then after she's there for a year she is going to be transferring to the university of oxford over in england and she her, her goal is to become a nurse that's what she wants to do she wants to become a nurse that's her career she has her plans laid out she has no time for family she has no time uh, for children. She's not interested in it. That's going to interfere with her goals she wants to accomplish as a businesswoman, as a person who is career-oriented. She has those goals. She has those things set up in life. What are your goals in life? 
What are your goals regarding your education? Things that you're going to do. What are your goals for a career? What are your goals that you have for a family? Or if you already have a family, what are your goals that you want to achieve as a family? You know, the rich man in our scripture probably had some goals too. He was probably educated. I'm guessing, being wealthy in those days, he was probably a businessman, maybe a merchant, maybe something else. Verse 19 says that he was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously. Those words, fared sumptuously, means that he feasted magnificently every day. So as he did this every day. He fared sumptuously. There was always food, and a lot of it, and good food on his table. He was not poor. He was clothed in purple and fine linen. Uh, purple back in those days was a very, very expensive color, very difficult to make, very expensive to make. And so whenever someone wore purple, you know, they say that purple is the color of royalty. And it's for this reason, because of how expensive it was to make the color purple. And so the kings and the rich men and the people, they would wear purple. And that way you knew when they were coming, they had purple on, that they had wealth, they had money. And he was like that. How did he get that way? How did he have so much of that money? As I said, he was probably educated, probably business, probably a career. But you know what? What happened to him? Verses 22 and 23. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. What good did all that education, what good did his vision, what good were his goals? What good was all of that? Where did it get him in hell? It got him to hell. Because he wants those things. My wife and I, we, we love the Victorian era. I mean, before we bought this house um, eight years ago, uh, we our plan was I had decided if I was ever going to get another house it was going to be a Victorian home always wanted a Victorian home all my life just that, that the beauty the splendor the the you know the grandness of it I just always wanted one of those old Victorian homes and so we looked for a home for three years that we looked and we looked at a bunch of old homes federal style homes and Victorian homes and we ended up buying just because of the way that God worked things we ended up buying this uh, turn of the 20th century um, you know old colonial farmhouse and it's not Victorian at all so we've kind of decorated it a little bit you know if you're here with church you see some of our decorations and stuff but uh, we, but we we have um you know, we've tried to turn it into a Victorian home through the, the way that we decorate our home. And it was kind of sad, really. But I was just sitting here thinking, I am 44 years old. My wife, Miss Samantha, is 47 years old. My parents, my mom, died when she was 64 years old, and my father when he was 67. 20 years difference between uh, where my wife and I are now and my parents when both of them went on home to be with the Lord. And you know what? After that, it's all gone. It's all gone. So I could sit here in my life and think, you know, I would really like to get that Victorian home and these Victorian furnishings and stuff like that. But 20 years, maybe, if I get that much and it's all gone. What, you know, what do I have to show for it? When, when everything's gone and done, what do I have to show for it? And by the way, if you've heard me preach at all about any length of time, really, I'm sure you would have seen me say something about the end times or last days. I don't even believe that my youngest, Juliet, who's only two years old, is even going to be old enough to be in school by the time that the Lord returns and, and, and Christ returns and, recall, and calls us home. And so we don't really have, in my opinion, a lot of time left. And when you stand before God, you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on that day, if you're saved, then what? What did that vision that you have do for you? What goals did you have? What were your goals individually, and what did that accomplish? What did that do for you? What do you have left? What is your vision? Do you have a vision for God? Do you have a vision to reach anybody for Jesus Christ? Do you have a vision to lead anyone else to the Lord? See, most of the time, if we aim at nothing, we're usually pretty successful at hitting what we aimed at. And I don't know what you want to do, but I'd rather aim at a lot and accomplish half of it that aim at nothing and accomplish all of it. And so the church needs a vision, and you need a vision. What kind of God do you serve tonight? It may be a vest pocket God. You might serve a vest pocket God. Vest pocket God, you get them out of your church, out of your closet on Sunday, and you put them on. You got them on. 
and you go to church, and you're wearing your vest pocket, God, and you sit in church, and the church service is over, and you come on home, and you take off your coat, and you go and you hang it up in your closet, and that's where your God stays, and you don't pick Him up, you don't think about Him, you don't talk about Him, you don't touch anything concerning Him for all week until Sunday morning comes around the next week, and then you get your God out and put Him back on. A vest pocket God. But I want you to know that the God that I serve is a pretty awesome God. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12 that he measures the volume of the waters of earth in the hollow or in the palm of his hand. God sits here, he, the hollow of his hand, the little space right there, that he can pick up all of the volume of the waters of the earth and hold that right in the palm of his hand. I mean, that's a good sized God. The, it says right there that he meted or measured out heaven with the span of his hand. That's, that's all of the known universes you can think of it. So God, the span of a, of a person's hand is right here from their thumb to their pinky finger. And they just he, he holds that, that, his hand out and he can span the entire universe. The entire universe is spanned by the palm of God's hand. That's a big God. I mean... People, folks, that means that God can do anything. That means that He can fix anything. Can God fix that relationship? Just like that. Can God change that situation at work with your boss or whether you're your fellow employee? Just like that. Can God heal that body of yours? Just like that. But you know what we do? We limit the power of God. Do you remember when Jesus returned to his hometown in Matthew chapter 13, verses, uh, verses 54 through 58? The Bible says that he did not do many mighty works. Why? Because of their unbelief. We can limit the power of God because of our lack of faith. Because we don't believe. And, and the Bible says that Jesus did not do many mighty works there in his hometown because the people didn't believe. The church needs a vision. We need a vision for lost people. We need a vision for, for backsliders, getting them right with God. What's a backslider? A backslider is a child of God that's fallen into sin. A backslider is anybody who is not as close to God today as you used to be. A backslider is a person who doesn't read the Bible as much now as they used to read it. And you can backslide in an awful hurry. I mean, I, I can backslide while I'm sitting up here preaching. And a preacher, and tell me, tell you what, if a preacher can backslide, then you out there listening, you can backslide just as well. We need to get a vision for backsliders. We need to help reclaim them. And we need to help get them right with God. Hey, listen. Do you know what would happen if just everyone who is a church member, all of the backsliders who are members of a church somewhere, if they would just come to church, if they would just get off of their rear and just come into the house of God on the Lord's day and just come to church, do you know what that would do for our community? Do you know that, what that would do for our country? I tell you what, our country, our government would wake up and, and they would start to take notice. If every, uh, you know, and, and every lost person who sees would perk up and say, hey, God's real. If we could just start paying attention and people would just start coming to church because why, why would that happen? Because the church finally started to mean business and people started to take notice. Next, we need to have a vision for those not in the church. And they are all over our community. There's churches, people, sorry, here, let me take a drink. My voice is getting a little hoarse. I think of these churches sometimes. I mean, some of these churches, they're just kind of trickling on. They keep going. You know, they haven't baptized a person in over a year. There's people who haven't gotten saved in that church over the year. No one is coming to visit, or very few people. And when they do, they don't stay. And, and I tell you what, when a, when a preacher is in a, he has a, a church like that, he, he really better start paying attention and taking notice and getting a little bit of concern in that because it's a good chance that the Holy Spirit has left. And if you don't do anything, you don't invite people to church, come to church, then, then that church is probably dead. And, and that pastor, 
he could be dead. Those people could be dead. They're just people dead in dead churches, and they don't do anything, and nothing happens about it. And then, you know, people need to get a vision for that. We, we as a church, we need to get a vision to help the church, and we need to get a vision of the lost. Some of you have lost children. Some of you have a lost parent, a lost brother, or a lost sister, lost friends, and you don't have a vision about them. I mean, they are out there in sin. They are sitting here dangling over the precipice of hell, and they're just sitting there, and you don't do anything about it. I mean, you're not trying to reach them. You're not trying to talk to them about their soul. You're not talking to them anything about it. I mean, you, you don't do a thing to try to get them saved. And, and, and some people say, well, I don't want to talk to them because because they're embarrassed or then I hear this one it's like you know I just try to live a good testimony and by living a good testimony that's going to get them saved well I tell you that's not enough I mean yes have a good testimony certainly have a good testimony if you have a rotten testimony and you go to witness to them they're not going to listen to you anyway you see you got to have a, t a good testimony but that's not enough there was a guy that was working with me he worked for me worked with me for two years uh, we're, you know, we're framing up at Michael's, and he, he stopped working there about a year ago. He's been off doing other things. Well, I just heard uh, through a mutual friend a couple of weeks ago that, that he died. The guy died. And he died of a drug overdose. And I was sitting there thinking, and I couldn't look back at a time that I ever sat, to, sat down with him and said, you know what, you're lost and you need to get saved. Let me tell you how. I don't remember ever telling him how to get saved or ever talking to him. I did invite him to church. He didn't come. You know, and I, and I was a good testimony in front of him. He never heard me swear. He never heard me telling dirty jokes. I mean, I, I was clean cut. I was, I was doing everything that a Christian does in their testimony. But yet, I never witnessed to him about Jesus Christ. And now, he is in hell. And I sit there thinking about that. And we're going to talk about that in a minute because that really scares me. And I'll tell you why. But we need to get a vision for the lost. What is a lost person? Lest I be mistaken, I will clarify it for you. A person who is lost is without Jesus Christ, without God, and without hope. That's the condition of a lost person. You need to see it, church, and you need to get a vision. A lost person is anyone who has never repented of their sins, asked Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sins, come into their heart, and save their wicked, ungodly soul. A lost person is someone that's like that. It's not a righteous person, by the way. The Bible says, that compared to the righteousness of God, that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And so your righteousness is not going to do it. You're not going to get to heaven because of your good works, or because some other other person is worse than you in your opinion you're going to get to heaven because you repented of your sin and if you don't you are going to go to hell and that's it that's what a lost person is someone who has not repented of their sin and they are in hell so we need to get a vision of that the next thing Boy, I'm getting a little, little uh, ragged on here. We need to get a vision of the lost. And the next thing that they have in hell that we need in the church, we're going to get back into our scripture, Luke chapter 16, verse 24. The Bible says that he cried. He cried. There's tears in hell. There's tears in hell. But I take a look at the church today, and you know what? I don't see very many tears. I don't see too many tears. Am I, and I'm here to report to you today, friend, that there will never be a revival in the church or in your life until we start to get some weeping going on at the altar. Until we start to get on our knees and begin to weep at the altar. We're too dry-eyed. We don't weep over lost souls. We don't weep over our sin. We don't weep over the condition of our church. We don't weep over the condition of our country. We don't weep. We don't weep. And if you doubt it, let me ask you, when is the last time that you've actually sat down and shed some tears anytime over any of those things that I just mentioned? When's that time? I tell you, God wants to see some tears. God wants to see some wet eyes. You see, when we weep, when we cry, God sees, God hears, and it does bring results. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 126, verse 5, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And again in Psalm 126, verse 6, He that goeth forth and weeping, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, 
bringing his sheaves with him. See, when you go out and you're weeping and crying about all these things I just mentioned, the condition of souls in our country and backsliders, and it gets you, and you're weeping and crying out to God. The Bible says that God hears that. And they go out and weeping, bearing precious seeds, spreading the word of God. But what happens? They come again in joy, rejoicing, bringing their sheaves with them, the people that they want to the Lord with them. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 5, Thus saith the Lord, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will hear thee. I want to ask you a question, and don't dodge it. How long has it been since God saw some tears in your eyes? How long has it been since God saw your pillow wet over your lost soul? Or your lost son? Or your lost daughter? Or your lost relative? How long? How long has it been since God saw you in the altar crying, crying out to God for deliverance or help or prayer for someone or our country or our condition or the church? How long has it been? How long has it been since God has seen some tears in your eyes? I'll tell you, God wants to see some tears. And when he sees them, he says, hey, you know, there's some tears down there. Those people down there, they're starting to mean business. Maybe I'll just take a step on down there and see what's going on. God does that. God wants to see some weeping for the things of God. We cry about everything. We cry when we don't get our way. We pout like a little spoiled baby. When something goes on, we don't like it, we go home and we stomp and we kick and we, we throw a fit and we get onto social media and put all kinds of stuff out there to speak our mind. No, we don't like it and we, have, and we whine and complain. We whine and complain all the time because we don't get our way. We listen to someone preach and they don't preach just quite the way that we want them to preach and we get all bent out of shape about it. I tell you what, we cry over soap operas, we cry over movies, we cry over TV programs. We cry because someone hurt our feelings, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, we don't weep over the souls of men. We don't weep. God wants to see some tears. And when he sees them, he says he'll do something about it. Paul said in Acts chapter, three, uh, chapter 20, verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Did Paul have a successful ministry? I mean, come on, tears, weeping with tears. God wants to see some tears. And if you get nothing else out of this message that I'm preaching to you today, I hope you at least get that. God wants to see some tears. He wants to see some caring. He wants to see some crying. It's not a sign of weakness to cry. You know, these people, I get these big macho men, don't cry. Mm, I'm not going to cry. Actually, it's hard to find a macho man in today's world. I mean, every man that you find is about as feminized as, as men can be. We don't even have any men anymore in this society. But it's just, say if I happen to find one, he's macho. No crying. I'm not going to cry. You get these people in church, and, and, and I watch them, and sometimes you know they, something's starting to touch them, and they'll reach back, and they'll get a handkerchief, or they'll just take their hand, and they'll, like, oh, they'll pretend to wipe the sweat off their brow, and then very quickly just you know go down and act like they're wiping the sweat out of their eyes when they're really wiping the tears, because they don't want anyone to see. And they're ashamed. They're ashamed because they don't want someone to think that, that, they're, that they're too caring, that they're soft. God takes notice of that too. You know, we're too dry. We're too hard. We're too calloused. And because of that, God can't use us. God can't use us. Something else that, the, that hell has that the church needs, the third thing we find in Luke chapter 16, verse 24. It says, The rich man said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Just so you know, that's not the same Lazarus that's the one that Jesus raised from the dead. Okay, it's a different Lazarus, different one. But there's flames. There is a flame in hell. And let me say this for those of you listening who may be lost. Hell is a real place. Hell is not a figment of imagination. 
Hell is not a separation from God, although you are separated from God, but it's not just this blank separation from God. Hell is not like that TV commercial where the guy wanted a glass of milk and he had died and he opened up and the fridge was full of milk cartons and he, as he poured all of those milk cartons, and, uh, every one of them was empty and he's like, oh, what kind of place is this? And it turned out that he was in hell. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, friend. Hell is not that way. Hell is not the place where you and your buddy are going to get together and say, hey, let's go gambling, pick up some girls, grab have a six pack and we'll have a party tonight hell is not like that hell is a lake of fire it is a real lake of fire when you are in hell you you are living forever i mean when it says that you're going to die in hell that's not talking about your physical death that's a spiritual death your soul and it's not going to cease to exist you are going to live in soul forever, ever, 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 ever in hell, burning in the lake of fire. You're going to be on fire. You're, 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 you're going to be screaming as, as, as your skin is on fire and as it melts and drips and runs off and your skin starts to cook and crack and break open, chunks of it fall off and then it regenerates so it can do it again. And it can cook and you can peel and you can you know, the, the juices will sizzle and run out of you again and again and again. It says in the book of Isaiah that the worms are over thee and the worms cover thee and the Hebrew, worm, Hebrew word for the worm, worm in those texts is maggot. The maggot maggot of hell you know when those people those pilots uh, and, and this is a true story okay i'm not i don't make these illustrations up true story there was these pilots who were flying over taking video of mount st helens as it was erupting out in washington and as those pilots in that helicopter were flying over the volcano watching it erupt their statement was that they looked down into the lava and it looked like they could see something crawling around in there they described it as worms they described it as maggots looked like they were crawling around in that lava and, and they said that, that they could hear hear screams coming from that volcano and just so you know there's a guy at work i was sharing this story with he is not a believer he does not want anything to do with god but he had heard that story somewhere else and he said you know i've heard that before i heard that from those pilots who were overhead as they saw that why because that's the lake of fire folks That's the lake of fire, and that's where you're going to be. But so I don't get all too far off a of off a of topic. Why, Brother Spencer, are you saying that we need fire in the church? The church can't possibly need the fire of hell. Well, we don't need the fire of hell. If you're saved, you're not going to experience the fires of hell, but we do need a fire. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost fire of God. The fire of God. They came down on those disciples at the day of Pentecost. And, and, and Peter got up and preached and 3,000 souls got saved. We need that. We need the fire of God, but we don't have it. I think of a cold day. You go outside and you're trying to get the, you know, you go outside to go to work and it's a cold winter's day and you get out to your car and find out that it was icy and there's ice all over the windshield. What do you do? Well, you could get an ice scraper and you can chisel that ice off or an easier way, you can turn the car on and let the heat build inside of the car. And as that heat comes up, it begins to melt that ice and that, might, and that ice runs down. You know, the best way to get the ice out of your cold, frozen, dead heart is to build a fire in your heart. Get yourself on fire for the things of God. And folks, in your Christian life, there is nothing that you need more than the fire of God. Some churches, they don't have the fire of God. Some churches are so cold. It's almost like you could get out your ice skates and just skate down the aisle. It's so cold, it's almost frozen over. Some of those preachers are so cold, they're so dead when they preach. You could sit there and pour a little bit of hot chocolate on his head. He'd make a real good Eskimo pie. I mean, some people are so dead, so cold. You know, and preachers are cold, churches are cold. I, I hear people talk to me, you know, uh, you know and, and I, have, I have degrees, there are preachers out there, they are so filled up on their degrees, they might have doctorates out the wazoo, but they're cold and they're dead. And they might have the degrees, but it's not the degrees that are important, it's the temperature. The temperature. I had a person on social media once, he had looked at my profile on LinkedIn, and he said, wow, you have more degrees than a thermometer. My reply back to him was, it's not how many degrees you have, it's the temperature that's important. It's the temperature. It's the fire. We need the fire of God. Those disciples were unlearned and ignorant fishermen. But the fire of God fell, I mean, and, and it stirred them up. The fire of God. 
there was this preacher, um, a friend of mine. He, he is a friend of mine now. He kind of was back then. We used to butt heads quite a bit. Back in my younger days before I'd gone to Bible college, and I, and I was not ignorant concerning the Word of God. I mean, I, I read it my whole life. I'd studied it. Excuse me. I studied it. I, I read the Bible. I knew a fair amount. I would sit down and start debating with him. And at the time, I was a roofer. I worked for a roofing company. And he would say something like, Scott, you know, if I ever want to put my roof on, I'm going to come to you because you know more about roofing than I do. If you ever want to know what the Bible says, then you come to me and ask me. Oh, that would just irk me. Oh, I would just get fighting mad with him. Well, you know, now he can't really say that anymore because I'm kind of, you know, as far as the degrees go, I, I'm, I'm up there in his league, I guess you could say and we actually get along pretty well now so in case he's listening out there and he happens to you know put two and two together you know we get along now so you know so we'll just skip over that but anyway i'm getting off track you need to build a fire you need to warm yourself up you need to get the fire of god in your life what happens when something's burning it gets exciting i mean doesn't it why do you think little kids are always out there with sticks and you have a bonfire always putting sticks in the fire and running around with fire because fire is exciting people get excited about that you need to get enthused about serving god you need to get excited you know you can probably tell that as i you know sometimes when i preach i tend to get a little emotional you can probably tell that sometimes i get a little animated when i preach yeah i, I think if a preacher is going to preach he needs to preach I think if you're going to spit, I, I picture some guy trying to spit, and he's out there, and, he, and, go, and the spit kind of runs down and, and trickles off of his beard or his chin and falls off his chin onto the ground. That, that's stupid. If you're going to spit, spit. If you're going to preach, preach. If you're going to serve God, then serve God. But do it. Don't just sit there and talk about it, think about it. Get excited about it. Fire spreads. Do you remember the great fire of Chicago? That started with a cow kicked over a lantern in a, bar, caught, in a barn, caught that barn on fire, and that fire spread, and by the end of it, the whole city of Chicago burned down. Fire spreads. The Holy Ghost fire is the same way. It spreads. It spreads from person to person. There was this guy, um, uh, his name is Brother Laughlin. He's home. He went home to be with the Lord about, uh, a while ago. But he, boy, he was a shouter. I mean, he was shout. He was excited about the things of God. He would shout. Someone would say something. Woo! Praise God! He would shout. You know, and, and that church at that time that he went to, and we went to that church with him, he would be there. And you know what? All around the church, people are like, Amen! Praise God! Preach it, preacher! There was fire in that church. And the church is on fire for God. Well, something happened. He went home to be with the lord and it seemed like the fire went out and and, and the other people they didn't shout anymore and, and if you go to that church now you're lucky to maybe you'll get one amen out of the whole service maybe if the preacher asks for the amen but there's just nothing that, that, no everyone's quiet what happened the fire started to go out the holy ghost fire it spreads it spreads from person to person if you don't if you doubt me then sometime when you're in church and the preacher says something go amen I guarantee you, someone next by, if, if the preacher's at preaching, ah, sorry, if the preaching's any good at all, within a few seconds of you saying amen, someone else will also jump up and shout amen. Why is that? Because it spreads. It spreads from person to person. It spreads from church to church. And it spreads from community to community. And you know what? As that happens, what happened? What comes about? Revival! If you study the history of the revival and you talk about the Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening, that's what it happened. I remember, I, I, I might get this story a little wrong. I don't have it in my notes. I didn't look it up. I'm just trying to remember from memory. But I think the Second Great Awakening started because there was a group of like three elderly ladies who were up inside of a room in a prayer meeting praying for their pastor to get the fire of God. And they prayed and prayed and prayed. And all of a sudden, one day, he got up in church and he started preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost of God and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And he was preaching with power and that spread through the church and the church had revival. And then the church next door, they came over to see what happened and they'd have revival. And people started coming from all over the place to see what was going on and taking it back to their churches. And pretty soon, I think this happened over in London. Well, it spread throughout all of London. And then it spread to England. And then it spread down to Europe. And then it made its way over to the United States. I mean, we had preachers coming out of the Second Great Awakening. You had Charles Finney, D.L. Moody, and, uh, and Billy Sunday and these, these Holy Ghost fireboxes out there preaching. People getting saved left and right. And the Great Awakening over there in London... 
the other. There, there was so much, everyone was on fire for God. There wasn't any crimes going on. People weren't in jail. The jails were empty. The cops actually had nothing to do, so they started grouping up and, and having like little barbershop quartets. And they would just go door to door, kind of like Christmas carolers. And they'd knock on the door, and they were just singing hymns when people would open up the doors because they had nothing better to do. What is that? It's revival. But you know what? We can quench it. That can happen today. That kind of awakening, that revival can happen today, but we quench it. Tell you what, if God tells you to shout, shout. If God tells you to say amen, say amen. If God tells you to jump, do it. You know, I, was, I was listening to a, I, I heard the story one time. Actually, I'll get to that in a minute. I was in church one time. Give you this illustration about me. I was in church service one time. There was a girl. She's a preacher's daughter. She was a friend of mine, good friend of mine. We were in church, and the invitation came up, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me to go over and witness to her and tell her she's lost. She needs to go up to that altar, and she needs to get saved. And, and, and I said, you know, God, but she's saved. She, she's the preacher's daughter. She's saved. She, she's not lost. I know her. I know her testimony. Holy Ghost said she's not saved. Go and tell her she needs to get saved. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to go. That's embarrassing. I don't want to get up and go over. So I sat there and sat there, and I'm sitting there, and they got the invitation going on, and all of a sudden, I knew I didn't have much time left, so I just I quietly you know, got up. I went over, and she had her head bowed, and I went over, and I just started tugging on her sleeve. And, and she turns and looks at me, and she's like, Scott, what's up? And, and I said, uh, you know, I don't know how you're going to take this, but this is the Holy Ghost of God just told me I needed to come and talk to you. He said, you're not saved. You're going to go to hell, and you need to go up and get saved today. And she kind of laughed it off, and she said, Scott, it's okay. I'm saved. Don't worry about me. I'm saved. And I was like, well, the Holy Ghost of God told me to come and say this to you. She's like, okay, thank you. I'm saved. And, and I went back to my seat. She didn't go up. And I was praying as, as they were closing the invitation. I said, God, I, I did what you wanted me to do. I told her. Well, you know what? That girl today, she's not in church. She's she is she's gone off the deep end. I see some of her stuff on social media. She got into the wrong crowd on the internet. I mean, she doesn't even believe that the that you can even have the Bible in any language other than Hebrew and Greek. Of course, she doesn't read Hebrew and Greek, so that means she doesn't read the Bible, or she relies on translations of people that she knows who say they do online. She says that the English Bibles are all corrupt. You can't read them. She's into this. She's now into healing crystals and telepathy and empath, and empath stuff. Feeling each other's emotions, borderline witchcraft, and I mean, she's just completely gone off the deep end. You go up and yeah, you know, if you visit her, she's you know letting her kids run around naked at the house, and and, and they're not little kids either; they're school age kids. I mean, stuff that is just wicked and wrong. And here she's doing all these things. She's not in church. Well, I can tell you what, it's because she's not saved. And when I told her the Holy Spirit sent me to go up and tell her that she's not saved, she should have listened because she's not saved. You know, there's, there's just something wrong. We got to do, you know, and, 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 you know, so she didn't get saved. Well, what would have happened if I hadn't said anything? At least I did what God wanted me to do. I was, another illustration, I was doing some roofing work once, and there was a revival meeting, uh, uh, Jack Parchman, the evangelist, coming up to the church we were attending, Bible Baptist Church of Horseheads, New York at the time, and I, I'm sitting there, I'm doing some work around the wall, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit calls me, and he says, you need to invite Preston to church. Preston was a friend of mine, I hadn't seen him in months. Preston was, he's kind of a rough him up, tough him up guy, last I learned that he had, he had gotten in a fight and he was in jail, I hadn't seen or heard from him in months, I'm like, how am I going to invite Preston? to come to the revival meeting. So I'm like, God, I, I don't know where Preston is. The Holy Spirit says he's at Donna's house. Donna was the widow of Preston's best friend who had passed away. And, and the Holy Spirit says, call her up. Invite Preston to church. So, you know, out of the blue, I mean, if you want to talk about getting embarrassed about things that you should or should not do, this is embarrassing. I, I, just, I went and I, I found an old book in the car of a time like a year ago when Preston had wanted to call her about something. It was sitting up on the dash, and, and I, on the cover of the book, her number was jotted down. 
So I went and I called up the number. I get the answering machine. And I said, hey, um, you probably don't know who this is. So we've met before, but my name is Scott. Preston used to work with me. And I said, you're going to think this is, you know, you might think this is completely off base. But the Holy Spirit of God just told me that I needed to call you and invite Preston to come to church tonight. We're having a revival up at this church. Revival's at, I think it was at 6 o'clock. I said, this is where it is. This is what. And the Holy Spirit of God told me to call you and leave that message. So thank you for your time. And I hung up. Left a message on the answering machine. And I'm sitting there thinking, boy, this is stupid. She's going to think all kinds of things about me. Well, you know what? I, I quit working. We went to the revival meeting that night. And guess who showed up? Preston, his ex-girlfriend, Patty, and Donna, the girl who I called. And it came to find out that Preston had just literally got out of jail. Preston had just decided that he was going to come and see Donna just to see how she was doing. And he said he had literally been in the house less than 10 minutes of time. And the phone rang and they were talking so they didn't answer it. And the answering machine picked it up, but they heard it. And here I am calling Donna to invite Preston to come to revival. They came to revival. And you know what? That night, Preston got saved, Patty got saved, Donna got saved. And the next night, they brought their kids to the revival, and the kids got saved. And a week later, there's like 20-something people coming to church with these people. They're bringing them to church. Why? Because I simply did what God told me to do, even though I thought I could be embarrassed. you got to get over it. Stuff like this happens. But we stop and we quench the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, I'll give you one more illustration. This happened at a revival meeting down south. I don't remember the name of the preacher, but uh, the, they're at the start of the service, and the Holy Spirit of God talks to them, and this is what he tells them to do. He says, I want you to take the offering plate, put it on your head, get down on all fours, your hands and, hands and knees, and crawl around this church. Crawl all the way around, all the way back to the church, come up at the altar. And the preacher said, like, no, God, I can't do this. This is stupid. The Holy Spirit says, do it! He says, God, I don't want to do this. embarrassing. The Holy Spirit says, do it! So he did. He got that offering plate, didn't talk to anybody, just went up, got on his hands and knees, started crawling around that altar, with a, uh, crawling around the, past the altar around the church, the offering plate on his head, everyone's staring at him, they think he's mad. You get around back up to the front, the Holy Spirit says, do it again. So he does it a second time, goes, crawls all the way around that church, all the way back up, comes back up to the altar, the Holy Spirit says, do it again. So he starts doing it again the third time. About the third time he says, about 10 or 12 other people got up and they started crawling around the altar with him. And all of a sudden, the fire of God fell on that congregation. People started repenting and confessing sin. And revival broke down. I mean, just God, why would it do that? The Bible says that God chooses the simple things to confound the wise. Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with what you did. Maybe the simple fact that God wants you to do what he tells you to do when he tells you to do it. And a lot of you, you quench the Holy Spirit because God tells you to do that, but you won't do it. Go talk to that person witness to him but you're ashamed you're embarrassed and you don't do anything and you put the fire out what does fire do fire gives us energy you know the church was scared behind closed doors the early New Testament church until the day of Pentecost. And then that fire fell on that day. And after that that little group of people they turned the whole world upside down. Why? The fire of God there's nothing deader than a dead church. If you're the driest well in the pasture, you can't show anyone else how to get a drink of water. We need the fire of God. And it's fascinating. There's something about the fire. People come to watch it, don't they? I mean, you know, if there's a fire truck and it goes by this road out here and, and you look out the window and you see that house up there is burning on fire, 99 times out of 100, you're going gonna, gonna to uh, get out and go on down and watch that house burn. I mean, there's something about fire. We like to watch it burn. We just like to. My wife, uh, Miss Samantha, years and years ago, there was a fire at a church nearby where she lived. They heard about the fire. She went down and she recorded it on video. Uh, she's got <laughs> the church burning down and she's recording the church. I mean, why, why would we do that? Because it's fire. Fire is exciting. I mean, there's something about it. We like to watch it. I mean... We, we went down to get my son David from college in, in Georgia uh, a couple of, uh, was about a month ago or so. We went down to, get, uh, to pick him up, and we're going down, and all of a sudden there's a tractor trailer over on the other side of the road, and, and it's on fire. 
So as any intelligent person, I pull a car over so we can sit and watch it burn. And we're watching it burn, and all of a sudden, boo, huge explosion, because one of the tires blew up. And then a second later, boo, another huge explosion. The other tire blew up, and my wife is like, "Hun, maybe we're a little too, too close. We should get away. I said, yeah, I think you're right. So I pulled another 10 feet up, and we pulled over again. And we're sitting there watching the fire burn. And, and you know what? All the other intelligent people who are driving by, they're doing the same thing. We got 10 or 12 cars pulled over sitting here. One guy got out of the truck. He's just standing out there watching it burn well the fire truck comes by and you know they they get the fire put out and then everybody gets on the road and we go back going see when there's no fire we're not sticking around to watch but when there's fire we're paying attention there's something fascinating about fire you like to watch it can you imagine what would happen to the church if it could get on fire for god i mean people would start coming just to watch it burn they start leaving their cold, dead church and coming over to the church to see what the excitement's about, where the fire is, and what would happen, what would that do? Well, if they're lost, they get saved. And those who are saved would start living for God, and then revival would break out. And then they'd bring in other people to get saved too, and the fire would spread. And it would spread, and it would spread, and it would spread. Now, how do you get the fire? How do you get the fire? Well... First, you've got to confess your sins. And God is not going to put that fire in your life if you're living in sin. You've got to confess your sins. You've got to repent of your sins. You have to turn away from your sins. You can't live in sin and expect that God's going to bless you. Then after you do that, you have to ask God to fill you. You have to ask God to fill you with the fire of God. And you've got to get away from your tradition and the things in church that are keeping you dead and cold. And you have to say, God, I need the fire of God in my soul. Give me the fire of God. And God will. You do those things. God will fill your heart and put you on fire. But you know what? You can also put the fire out. You can put it out by throwing all kinds of stuff on it, like rubbish and trash and the filth and the stuff that you do in life and your wickedness. You can put that on and it will smother that fire out. You'll put it right out. Number four, something else they have in hell that we need in the church. Luke chapter 16, verses 27 and 28. They pray. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they come also into this place of torment. They have prayers in hell. You know, we keep quoting that verse of scripture. We did it all through our Operation Heal America and also through our family series, Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven I will hear, uh, forgive their sin and I will heal their land but what do we have to do we have to pray we, have ser we had all these sermons on prayer and, and, and if you didn't notice I was doing it with my family series but continued right on into Operation Heal America and also I was continuing to preach it on Father's Day and Mother's Day kind of beating a drum to this I made the comment talking about getting the power of God in our life through fasting and prayer prayer over and over and over again. Fasting and prayer. Prayer changes things. It did for Hezekiah in Isaiah chapter 36 and 37. If you read it, Hezekiah, he's the king. He's been threatened by Assyria that they're going to come in and they're going to conquer his kingdom. And then he receives a, a further letter threatening him. And that letter says, you know, we've conquered this nation and this nation and this nation. And those gods of those nations, they cried out to their gods, but their gods didn't do anything. And the king of Assyria came in and he conquered them and them and them. And he said, your God can't do anything for you. Your God's not going to do anything for you either. And, and Assyria is going to conquer you just as well. And you know what Hezekiah did? It says he took it to the house of God and read it out before the Lord. I mean, I, I literally think it would be like if he went to a church today, he got the letter and he gets up there, gets on his knees in front of the altar, lays the letter down on the altar and says, you know what, God, this is the letter I got. I read it. Now you read it and tell me what you think about it. And he cries out for God to save them. You know what happened the next day when they woke up in the morning? They found 185,000 dead Assyrian soldiers laying on the battlefield. 185,000 dead Assyrian soldiers. When they went to bed, they were there. They wake up in the morning and they're all dead. Why? One man prayed. One man prayed. 
Do you remember Peter in jail in Acts chapter 12? I mean, he's sitting there. The Bible says that there was four quaternions of soldiers. A quaternion is a group of four, 16 soldiers guarding him. He's shackled by his hands and his feet. He's getting ready. They're going to kill him the next morning. And all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord comes in and kind of comes over. Peter's asleep, kicks Peter in the side. Peter, get up. Come on, let's get out of here. And the shackles fall off of his hands and feet. And the angel says, come on, put your coat on. Put your top coat on as well. It's cold outside. And so Peter, he gets his coats on, and they start walking. For 16 soldiers standing around. They start walking toward the door, and the, the prison cell opens, and they walk out, and they come, and then the door to the prison opens, and they walk out, and they turn around, and they walk down the street. Soldiers back in the prison, all of a sudden, they're turning around. Where, where did Peter go? All of a sudden, what? They, they don't even, they even see him leave. And there are 16 of them, folks. I don't think they were sleeping. All of them? No, I don't think so. Not at all. There was one on one side and one on the left of Peter. No one saw a thing. Peter gets out. The angel leaves him. All of a sudden, he at first he thought it was all a dream. Now he realizes, oh, this is real. He goes down and, and, and goes down to the house where they were all praying. What, what were they doing there? I kind of stole my thunder. I just said it. They were sitting there. They were praying. The church was praying for Peter while this happened. Prayer changes things. Did you know... That there are people today, maybe even you, but maybe friends, relatives, that you know people in the church who are in bondage just like Peter was. They're in bondage right now. I mean, they're chained. They've got the shackles of drunkenness in their life. They're chained with the shackles of pornography. Looking at those dirty images. I mean, they're chained. They're chained. They're stuck in the LGBTQ community. Or they're chained and shackled with this whole gender identity movement. Or I should say crisis. You know what will free them from this? What would free them from this? If the church got a burden for their lives and got on its knees and started to pray for them. When's the last time you prayed for them? Prayer changes things. There was this guy, I mentioned Brother Laughlin earlier, there was this guy, he was the shouter that I mentioned. He, there was this guy he was witnessing to for years. His name was Tony. I don't remember his last name. But he would witness to him and witness to him and witness to him and he didn't want anything to do with it. I mean, this guy was wicked. This guy was awful. He lived just lived for the devil. He was wicked as hell. And he witnessed to him and witnessed to him and he witnessed to him and he would come and he would pray and they would call up prayers. Say, I please, dear God, let Tony get saved. Please help him get saved for years for years he did it and now they're old men and all of a sudden something changes and tony gets saved and i mean miraculous change he's now living for god serving for god unfortunately he they were elderly he didn't live too much longer he only lived a few months you know it might have been much different had his whole life but you know i and i don't know why it took so long for him to get saved but they stuck with it. He witnessed to him. He kept praying with him. And he did get saved in the end. We need to get a burden. Prayer changes things. You may have someone in your life that you love. You say, it's hopeless. It's not hopeless. It is not hopeless. Maybe the reason they haven't gotten saved is because they never heard their name cried out to God by you in prayer. There's this movie we just saw recently. It's called What If. It's Pure Flix Entertainment puts it out. Kevin Sorbo's in it. Really good movie. I mean, it really touched my heart. You all should watch and check that out. What If. Good movie. Well, there is a part in there where, you know, the, the guy, he is, he's really struggling with his faith and stuff going on. And then he hears his wife. She's upstairs praying, and he happens to walk by the stairs. She didn't know that he was listening to him. But she's crying out to God, asking God to help him and get his life and, you know, help him in everything that's going on. And then later on in the movie, he makes a comment. He says, hey, do you have any idea what that did for me? Hearing my name called out to God in prayer. Do you have any idea what that did for me? He's like, there's just something about it. And, you know, and, and yes, that's a movie, but that can be real life. I mean, that's, that, that stuff does happen in real life. Maybe the reason why someone didn't get saved is because they never heard you crying and calling their name out to God in prayer. How long has it been since your loved one has heard their name called out by you in prayer? How many times has it been since your kids saw you at an old-fashioned altar on your knees crying out to God, praying for them? How long has it been? How long has it been since that happened? You say, well, I don't want to. It'll embarrass them. They'll get embarrassed if I do that. So what? 
So what if they get embarrassed? I'd rather have someone go to hell embarrassed that I tried to win them rather than go to hell in a good humor because I was too embarrassed to try to talk to them about it. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes people. Prayer brings fire. Elijah prayed on top of the mountain, and it says that when he prayed that the fire fell. Down came the fire. The fifth thing they have in hell that we need in the church is people have a soul-winning heart. You read about that rich man. He's like, I pray thee, Father Abraham, send him to my father's house because I have five brethren, and, and tell them, lest they come to this place of torment. They have a soul-winning heart. It's sad that they don't get concerned about their loved ones until they're in hell, until it's too late. They should have cared back then when they still had a chance. How many of you care about winning someone to Jesus Christ? Turn your Bibles, please, to Ezekiel chapter 3. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture really quickly. This is the best soul-winning passage of Scripture that I've ever found in the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 17. We'll read through verse 21. It says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. Now we'll stop right there. He says, you know, whenever you're reading in the Old Testament, it's always talking about Israel, the New Testament, you know, because Israel is God's chosen people. Well, in the New Testament, we have the church. So we can take, we can make application. Whenever it says Israel in the Old Testament, you can just put the word church in there. Son of man, I made thee a watchman unto the, unto the church. Therefore hear the word of my mouth, this book, sorry, I knocked my compass over up here. This book, this book right here that I'm holding in my hand, Hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. It says, When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous man sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned, then thou hast delivered thy soul. Let me just put that in layman's terms for you. You are the watchman. God has given you the word of God, and he tells you in here that people need to get saved, and if they're sinners, they're going to go to hell. And he says, you, your job is to warn them from me. Warn them for me. Go out and win them to Jesus Christ. But this he says, that if you don't do it, he, they're gonna, he says they're going to die in their sin, but he's going to require their blood at your hand. I think of that man that I mentioned that I worked with for two years. But he left for a year ago, but I worked with him for two years. And sure, I lived a nice testimony. Sure, I did all that. But I never tried to win him to Jesus Christ. And today, he's in hell. And you know what? I, God's going to require his blood at my hand. You know, I don't even know what that means. I honestly don't. I have no idea what it means when he says that he's going to require the, the souls of the people that I could have witnessed to but didn't. That they're going to be in hell, but he's going to require their blood at my hand. You know what, though? I don't know what it means, but it scares me to death. And it ought to scare you to death. What ought to do? It ought to motivate you to go out and warn them about hell and judgment so that they get saved. That's what it ought to do. It ought to get you on fire for God so you warn people about sin and hell and death and lead them to Jesus Christ. That's your job. You want a vision, folks. That's what your vision should be. Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verse 26 and 27, Wherefore I take you to record this day. That means I, you, know, I'm, you, you can keep me to record. I'm testifying to you that this is true. That I am pure or free from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I read that in my devotions one day. And I just, wow, it just hit me. Oh my gosh, it just flooded me. with. The, I, I can feel the Spirit of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Paul, from the moment he got saved... He talked to everybody. 
There wasn't one person that he didn't witness to. You say, well, okay, it's easy for him to do that. He's the preacher. Well, he went, <laughs> yeah, Paul was a preacher, but he didn't get all of his money to do things just from the gifts of love from churches. He went around, he was preaching, he went into new places. He was basically a missionary, an evangelist, a church planner, a preacher, a preacher, pastor, all of it, all in one. Paul wrote the bulk of the New Testament. He went all over the place. How did he get funding for doing it? He worked. Paul was a tent maker. Paul made tents for a living. And then as he would get money from making and selling tents, then he would be able to have money, food and stuff, and go around and be able to fund his things to go out and preach to people and win them to the Lord. But it says that he is pure from the blood of all men. That means at his job, at his business, that every single person that, that Paul sold a tent to, he shared the gospel with. That means that every person that looked at his tents, even if they didn't buy any, he shared the gospel with. That means that every person who just came walking by where he was selling tents, he shared the gospel with. Every one of them. Everyone. What do you do at your job, folks? You're out there, with, oh, I might get fired. I, I'm, not, I'm not sitting here encouraging you to go do something that's going to get you fired from your job. But you know what? You can also you can witness to them after work. You don't have to witness to them at work, but you can witness to them. How, how many people do you work with that if they all died today and went to hell, their blood would be on your hands? You need to get a vision of that. They have a vision of that in hell. They have a soul-winning heart in hell. How many people does it get to win someone to the Lord? Do you remember Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 25? It's talking, that's when the, the man needed to be healed, and Jesus was in, in, you know, in the building preaching, and they went up on top of the building, and they actually removed a portion of the roof, and they tied ropes onto the corner of this man's bed, and four men lowered him down into, you know, into the room where Jesus was from off the rooftop, and then Jesus not only healed him, but he also saved him. You know, it still takes four people to lead a soul to Jesus Christ today. It takes four people. It takes God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and you. Four people. It takes four people to lead Him. It takes the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and it takes you. You need to get Him here. Maybe you can't win it to him at work. Maybe you you just you can't figure out the scriptures, and maybe you don't know. You can at least invite him to church. I heard the illustration of a little girl, a little girl probably about the age of Scarlet, probably about seven, eight years old, maybe even younger than that. She was saved. Her daddy wasn't. She was trying to get him into the church, and she'd nag him and nag him and nag him and nag him, and finally one day he's like, okay, okay, I'll go to church. And, and, and the story was told. There was deacons out there. They heard this happen. They saw this happen. That little girl, she gets her daddy to church. Her daddy comes up, and he's walking in before him and she came up and she just kind of put her hand right on the small of his back and just kind of pushed him as he went inside and they heard her say this she said okay okay god i got him here now you save him and you know what happened that day that man gave his heart to jesus christ and he got saved and born into the family of god you know sometimes you just got to get him here the very least you can do is invite them to church and get them here. Just get people here. You say, well, I invite people all the time. Well, how much of this other stuff do you do? Are you weeping for them? On your knees praying for them? Are you doing all of that? Because, you know, I truly, I do believe this. I truly believe that if you will put forth the effort in your life to be all of this stuff, that if you put forth the effort and get them in the church, I do believe that God will save them. If you care enough about them to put forth that effort, I do believe God will save them. And the sixth and last thing that hell has that the church needs the rich man says I pray thee father Abraham send him to my father's house so that they will what so that they will sign a card join the church it's not what it says does it so that they will repent repent we need old fashioned repentance I don't know what you need to repent of in your life today I could stand here all day and guess and probably get it wrong. But you know what the funny thing is? You know what you need to repent of today. You know it. You know what you need to repent of. And did you know that that rich man, he is still in hell? And this really happened. This is not a parable. This isn't one of those stories that Jesus just told. This really happened. This rich man has been in hell, and he has been in hell a long time. Thousands of years. 
still crying out for that drop of water. But you do know what? Do you know why he's there? Do you know why that rich man is in hell? He knew it. He said it. He wanted his brothers to repent so that they wouldn't be there because he knew that it was because he did not repent that he was there. Let me clarify that again. He wanted Lazarus to go and warn his brothers so that his brothers would repent of their sin so that they wouldn't go to hell with him. He understood and knew that he was in hell now because he did not repent of his sin. You have to repent of your sin. And you know what? He's still there, still screaming for that drop of water, still frying like a sausage in the lake of fire. Why? Because he failed to repent. They have repentance in hell, but it's too late for them. But you know what? It's not too late for you. Has there been a time that you have repented of your sins? Has there been a time when you asked Jesus Christ to save your soul? Everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed, no one looking around. I feel led of the Holy Spirit of God just to go right into an invitation. Sometimes I ask people how many of them are saved and a testimony and stuff like that. I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to say if any of you are listening, I don't, I don't want to embarrass you, friend. I know some people get embarrassed. We preached a little bit about that. I'm not, I'm not trying to rip a rail on you. I don't want to embarrass you, you know, but just I, by a raising of hands or anything. But if you need to get saved today, if you need to get saved, if you would like to come and know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'm going to pray a prayer. You pray after me. But listen to me. The Bible doesn't say if Scott Spencer prays that he'll save you. He says that if you'll pray, He'll save you. I'm going to pray out loud. You pray in your heart. You pray out loud. You pray however you want to pray. Repentance is the key. You must repent of your sins. I'm going to pray. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. But I know that you died on Calvary's cross to forgive me of my sins. Lord Jesus, I, I, I now repent. I'm now going to turn from my sins. I have lived a sinful life, God, and I don't want to be this way anymore. I repent of my sins. And, and, and folks, let me just intercede to say that you know what you need to repent of. So confess that. Do that. Confess that. Said, repent of that sin. Turn from that sin today that is keeping you bound by the devil's chains. Lord Jesus, I repent of this sin. Dear God, I confess this sin before you. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I've done it, but I don't want this anymore. I don't want my sin anymore. I repent, Lord. Please Forgive me for committing this sin, these sins that I do, this, this wicked sin that's in my life. Please forgive me. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to live my life for you. Come into my heart and save me. Please forgive me and save my soul. Please come into my heart. Let me live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You say, well, how, you know, isn't that too simple? That's not simple at all. I mean, I mean that is simple. But it's not simple to do because you're going to have to repent and turn from your sins. You're going to have to turn from your sins, but if you do it, He'll save you. Romans 10.13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you will repent of your sin, He will save you today. How many of you out there would say, Brother Spencer, you know what? I need the fire of God. I'm not living for God. I might be saved, but I'm a backslider. Any of these things, just pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I have not been living for you. Please, Lord, help revive my soul. Dear God, please help me. Help me to repent of the sins that I have allowed to quench that fire of the Holy Spirit of God in my life. Please help me to start living my life for you. Give me the fire of God. Let it fall on my life. Please, God, fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Let me get a burden for lost souls. Let me get a burden for my lost family, my lost friends. Dear God, let me get a burden for the people I work with. Please, God, give me some tears that I may shed some tears for the souls of men. Please help me to get a vision for the things of God, not just my own selfish goals and desires. Please help me get a vision of these things. Dear God, help me to be able to change my life and live my life a testimony for you so that when I stand before you, I can be like Paul and say, I'm free of the blood of all men, not being guilty with their blood on my hands. Please help me to get this in my life, Lord, and revive my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Friend, I pray that you prayed that. I pray that if you're not living for God, that you'll make that change, that you'll start living for God today. And I pray that God will, that today's sermon hopefully will make a difference in your life. I pray that God will be with you. And I pray that you'll keep on coming back here or listening to us online at the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship. I'd just like to thank you all for coming and, and, and watching us online. 
please may God bless you as you go on your way. May God watch over you and bless you and help you to get that fire. Live for God and help you to make a decision that I'm going to live my life for Jesus Christ today. I'm going to change. I'm not going to live for myself. I'm going to live my life for my Lord. May God bless you as you go on your way. Take care.